All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is with great pleasure that I uh, kick off the September webinar, the professional development webinar with Dr. Emily Sa, who is an associate professor of curriculum and instruction at Texas State University. Um, I am a huge fan of her work, and I think that uh, she does a lot of scholarship on, on faculty issues and on teaching and learning in college contexts that is very, very relevant to our network. And so we're very, very pleased to welcome her. And Dr. Sa, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you for making space for me. Um, I actually was really, really excited when I got first the invitation to become part of Catch the Next, um, but then to be able to come and chat with y'all today. I spent um, a little under a decade in the community college system. Um, and this kind of a space, Catch the Next, um, was the kind of space that I would intentionally seek out in order to get the professional development that would feed my soul. And so when I transitioned um, to the four-year context and to teaching teachers, I really felt that loss keenly for a while until I kind of found my, my professional footing and realized that, you know, Bon Jovi isn't right, you can go back home. Um, and so it's been really fun to kind of play in these spaces and continue to learn with and from practitioners. Um, and so I'm just really grateful to everybody for making space for me to be here with you. Um, and especially on a Thursday that feels like a Friday, at least if you're live. Um, so I wanted to talk really informally. I hope that this is more of a chat um, than a structured um, lecture or anything like that. But I wanted to talk about building beloved community as a freedom dream for creating student ready colleges, particularly in the era of anti equity legislation. See if I can advance my own slides. Okay, so um, when Dr. Doran asked me to do this originally, I was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll come and talk and I'll worry about what I say later. Um, and then kind of serendipitously, um, NOS, the National Association for, um, or the National Organization for Student Success, asked me if I would do a similar talk um, in about two weeks. And they sent me some questions from their previous webinar um, in preparation for the talk that I'll give. And these were the questions that some of their network members asked me to think about. And I thought that they were really helpful in kind of guiding our conversation today. And so I'm hoping that these can kind of become some framing questions that we think about as we kind of engage in this journey this afternoon together. Um, and so the first question that they asked are, what are institutions doing to address the legal environment surrounding DEI initiatives and the removal of these offices? And in Texas, we feel this very keenly, right? How do, DE, how do leaders help DEI and belonging work in their areas? And how do they influence throughout their college universities? How are leaders leading their teams through these areas, especially in regard to current legislation, loss of jobs or fear of loss of jobs, criticism, et cetera, and also working with attorneys to see what is admissible and what isn't. And then finally, what are institutions doing to continue serving marginalized communities in states where DEI practices and offices have been discontinued? And so for the next like 40 or so minutes together this afternoon, I hope we can engage on a journey together. We're gonna travel a bit. Um, and I'd like us to begin with kind of some gratitude and just centering in the community, the space that we're in. Um, I know that Catch the Next is really intentional about scaffolding with mentoring and support for practitioners. And so I do wanna honor that work that you've already um, been doing. I also want to invite you to engage reflexively with me as we think about what this work means to us personally, um, as individuals, perhaps as people of color or who are directly impacted by some of the anti-equity legislation um, in our personal lives, as well as how this impacts us as professionals. Um, we'll look very, very briefly um, at a map nationally to try and understand the exigent need. And then we'll talk about a framework um, of freedom dreaming and the beloved um, community in order to think about what this means for building a student ready college. And finally, um, we'll end with a commitment to action. So I always like to begin with gratitude and centering um, because I think that it's so important to acknowledge the work that people who come to these spaces do every day. Um, you're clearly not in it for the money. You're in it because you love your students. You love 
the work that you do and you believe in open access institutions and educational justice. Um, and I don't know if any of your students have come up to you today to give you a hug and a high five, but you deserve it. Um, so I wanna say thank you. So thank you for the work that you do, for continuing to inspire so many generations, not only of students, but also educators, myself included. Um, and thank you for making space for me today to come and learn with and from you. I also wanna take a moment to center. Um, in all of my classes, whether it's my undergrad classes with my developmental literacy students or whether it's my doc classes, so people who are training to become professors um, in and hopefully run learning assistance centers, writing centers, or, or teach developmental literacy classes, we always begin by centering. We take a couple of cleansing deep breaths to breathe out our anxieties, but also our love for the other members in the community. We breathe in deeply right, to share the wisdom um, and the love and the strength of other members of our community. And we just prepare ourselves to be ready to receive and learn from each other. And I think that that's a really important practice, especially in this kind of frantic Zoom based world where we're lucky if we get like a three minute bio break between our Zoom meetings. Like there should be space to center and be physically present in our work. I also wanna take a moment to invite you to engage reflexively um, with me. Um, and I think about this through the work of Asao Inouye and what he wrote in the journal um, for um, college reading and learning um, 2020, he wrote a piece on anti-racist reading. And essentially it was a mindfulness piece, right? Um, but he framed it in anti-racism um, as well as mindfulness. And he said that that work needs to begin by like centering yourself and your awareness as you engage with a text or with a PowerPoint and in community today. And it's important that as we're listening and as we're observing the wisdom of the community, that we note slides or concepts that invoke a strong reaction, whether positively or negatively. Um, and that we then pause to examine our feelings and our emotional investment in the responses that we feel. What is it that's triggering what we're feeling and why are we feeling those feelings? Our feelings are real and they're legitimate. And then finally, take a moment to question the origin of our feelings. Are they based in our personal experiences, our professional experiences, our biases that we hold, or the stakes that we have, right? We're talking about equity work and justice work at a time when our state is telling us that um, people don't have a right to control their own bodies, let alone the way that their curriculum is delivered in a class. So what is it that we're holding on to that charges us emotionally? Um, what is the origin of that? If we can acknowledge those things, then we'll be able to work together with other stakeholders to find points of commonality to try and grow together. So this is a slightly outdated map now, um, but this is a map from January 29th of this year, so the beginning of this year, um, and it lists all of the states that had proposed legislation that eliminated DEI programs or offices and college on college campuses. So you see that those of us in Targus, in Texas, we feel this very keenly on a very personal level. Um, we experience it oftentimes in our own institutions, and we recognize that this part, this is part of our regional, our institutional culture now. How do we continue to do the work that we know is so essential to providing access to post-secondary education if we're not allowed to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Particularly when, and again, I'm a literacy scholar, right? But we're told that we're not allowed to talk about these things by people who are making the laws but not defining that which we shall not discuss, right? It feels very like Voldemort Harry Potter um, in like this space where we know we're not supposed to talk about a thing, but we're not even sure what the thing means to the people who are saying that we can't talk about it. And they're the folks that are in power. So how can we continue to do the work that's necessary if we're being told that we can't have conversations around it and we're not even really sure what the it is? So on my own campus, we've been engaging in a lot of transformational work, trying to rethink what it means to continue to serve our students. We are an MSI, we're an HSI. We've received recently the Seal of Excelencia, which we all know if, if your institution is involved in anything like that, it means that your president may have traveled somewhere to get a plaque 
but that that plaque was awarded, that the real meaning of excelencia comes from the work of the practitioners, the educators who daily engage with students, right? So how do we do this work as practitioners in spaces like this? Um, and I want to suggest that we do it by freedom dreaming, um, and particularly by drawing from the wisdom of Martin Luther King and others um, in thinking about what it would mean to build beloved community in the college level, and to do this in order to tie directly to Tia Brown McNair and her colleagues' work on creating the student-ready college. And so that's a lot of like putting a lot of buzzwords all together, and may, hopefully we'll form some sort of a buzzsaw here, right? But but we'll kind of process what this means, and then we'll think about what this actually means, not only as a framework, but what this means for our practice, right? So first of all, the first phrase in there that I think needs to be defined is this notion of freedom dreams, right? So freedom dreams is a phrase that comes um, from um, people who were enslaved who talked about creating hush harbors and dreaming of conditions which they themselves knew they would never live to see, which they had never personally experienced, but which they knew that could be built for their children and their children's children. More recently, um, the National Equity Project defined freedom dreams um, as that which look like disability justice and queer liberation. It's bodily autonomy and self-determination. And let me just pause here so you can, again, kind of reflect on what those mean, recognize any emotions you're feeling in your body in response to this, particularly in the state of Texas, right? Freedom dreams sound like the whispers of revolution that grow and build and reverberate into booming cries that Black lives matter. They ripple through intergenerational movements and manifest in the reimagining of community care, and they feel like holding each other closely, taking a deep breath of crisp air and wading into a clear lake. So what all does that mean for us in the daily work of supporting our students and supporting ourselves? I would like to think about our freedom dream as building an inclusive space and particularly an inclusive space that recognizes all community members and re-envisions and recreates an institution that's focused on student-defined success. Texas State, along with I think almost every other post-secondary institution across the country, is really focused on student success right now. In fact, we have two pillars from our president currently. One of them is a run to R1. Sometimes I feel like it's more like an army crawl, right? And then the other piece of that is this notion of student success. But nowhere in the calls for student success has anyone asked our students, what does success look like for you? What does that mean for you? In an institutional context where we admit more students than we can house on campus, where a significant proportion of our students, despite the fact that we are the second or third largest institution in the state um, and the, the second largest um, program or, or college of education, right? We still have significant numbers of students who are dealing with housing insecurity, food insecurity, who are regularly going to our dean of students saying, I don't have money for for gas, can I get a bus pass? Can I get a one-time assistance in order to pay my electricity bill? What does success look like to those students, right? That's how I'd like us to rethink and recenter as we engage. So it's really nice for us as educators to come together and think about recentering around students. That's the majority of work that you do, right? If I asked you to think about all of the meetings or interactions that you had today, I bet 95% of those were with students and then 5% were like the administrator you couldn't duck in the hallway, right? Or the Zoom meeting that you couldn't get out of. But when it comes to making connections and building connections across um, divergent perspectives and with multiple stakeholders, one of the things that I've come to embrace is Tia Brown McNair and colleagues work um, on the student ready college. And I think that this framework is really important because it's written in really clear, really easily accessible language that appeals to administrators. So it's like 14 point font with a lot of bullet points and it's like a 189 page book, right? It's not like a heavy academic tome. It gives a lot of straightforward examples um, and easily digestible, almost sound bites um, that in get administrators excited about equity work. And this right here are kind of the seven things that Brown and McNair um, and colleagues lay out. And I won't read them all to you um, piece by piece, but ultimately they include using data 
of multiple forms to create a sense of student belonging and mattering, right? So centering around our students. They also talk about intentionally aligning our vision of being student ready with our institutional mission, because if any of you are in administrative roles or if you've seen the way that your institution works from kind of the inside out, you recognize that money is power, right? And so if you can connect what you want to do in your program to the institutional values or mission statement or strategic plan, then oftentimes it's much easier to earmark funds to support that work. Third, Brown McNair and colleagues also talk about this notion of this culture of inclusive leadership. So despite the fact that they're writing to and for and with um, pretty high level administrators, they're talking about creating a space where everyone feels like they are equitably invested, if not equally invested as leaders, where everyone has a shared sense of ownership over the work of creating the Student Ready College. They also talk about getting feedback from students on their experiences and their performances from a range of sources and thinking about this work in terms of long term big picture plan. And this can be really challenging, particularly when you've outlived multiple university or college presidents, right? They might have more turnover than, you know, your two year, four year degree seeking students, right? So helping these administrators think about the work that we're engaging in as not something as short lived as the success of a student in your class in this term, but as a broader culture shift that's going to take longer than maybe even one individual's term in leadership is an important change. They also talk about understanding our student outcomes as consequences of student choice. And I think that this is particularly important, especially for those of us who serve as frontline educators, those of us who are daily engaged um, in working with students. Because I think if you look at bullets, you know, one through five on this list, or even number seven, it's easy to think that the onus of this work falls all on the educator. It's all about accommodating the student. And so our sixth point here is where Brown McNair and colleagues are really saying the way that our students respond in these ecosystems of care that we're trying to create in these student ready colleges, as opposed to creating college ready students, that also requires a certain amount of investment on their part, a certain amount of accountability and willingness to buy in, to collaborate, to become an equitable partner and stakeholder in this work. So there are things like consequences, right? Creating a student ready college doesn't mean that there's no such thing as late work even after grades are submitted, no. There are standards, right? And those standards are there to support our students, to help them grow and to help them achieve their goals. Because I don't think many of our students come into our classes and say, you know, my goal for this class is to turn in everything after the semester is done. They come in because they have dreams of doing things in the medical field. They have dreams of becoming HVAC you know, trained or or nursing students or they, they want to become physical therapists, something like that. And all of these are professional spaces where they will need to engage with other members of the community where they will need to be accountable. And our classroom spaces, right, our learning assistance spaces are places for them to engage as members in those disciplinary committee communities. And then the last piece of this is prioritizing continuous improvement. This isn't just about the next administrator coming in and saying, this is the phrase or the mission statement du jour. This is the thing that we're going to invest in for a year and then we're moving on to the next thing, right? This is about investing our resources so that we are drawing from multiple data sources. We're collecting information, not only from our students or our administrators, but also the folks who are engaged in teaching our students directly. And we're reflecting on what we see through continuous cycles of observation and innovation that require everyone to engage. So my gosh, that was a lot, right? Like we can just end this Zoom webinar right now and start a happy hour, right? Like y'all got it now and it's super easy, right? Um, the problem with that list by Brown McNair and there, and again, it's a phenomenal book. I think it's, it's really well written to address a particular audience. Um, but what oftentimes get overlooked um, when we're in conversations with administrators or by administrators about folks who aren't administrators is that these aspirational lists kind of forget the who and the how. Right, so just go out there and get some data, analyze your data continuously while you're still doing all of the work that you normally do with students and then solve all your problems and commit to doing equity work. That's all this is gonna take, right? 
um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and so I wanted to think about what this work means for, for you and what this list, and I can put it back here on the screen, but what this list looks like in practice. I have a couple of ideas, but before I go out there and keep telling you all the things, I'd love to hear from anybody. I was just going to add, um, I put it in the chat that a really, really fantastic companion book to the Student Ready College that Tia Brown McNair was a co-author on is From Equity Talk to Equity Walk, which I think helps actually kind of get at what you're talking about in terms of like the who and the how and how you start being really intentional in like this sort of accountability stuff that we all um get hammered with every single day in our jobs, but like we don't necessarily get into the minutia of like how you operationalize that and, and how you enact it. I really appreciate the, the case study approaches or the vignettes in that book, right? Um, I think that it's one thing to read a vignette about a college president who feels like he solved it all. Right. It's a different thing to hear about somebody who's at a community college who's doing this work specifically with students who's participated in workshops with the Center for um, Urban Education, right, or the Center for Race and, um, and Equity at University of Southern California, and who's doing the work um, at a level that feels closer to my own at the institution. I, I appreciate that book as well. Are there examples of where your institution is committing to any of these? pieces of the work or where you realize you're falling short? You know, I think one thing that we just as an organization are engaged with um, in, in conversations about is like, how do we do um, really equity centered um, in assessment across all of the colleges? Um, when all of the colleges have different, like, for example, they offer different levels of math courses or different um, numbers of math courses. So how do we engage in assessment practices that can give us reliable data and can help us to, to do the kind of things that we wanted to do um, and, and respond to student needs as much as we're able to? Um, I think that... Um, the feedback on the student experience is something that I think we rely heavily on and in understanding where, where are the ways that we help students and, and what are the things that they appreciated by participating in the program and stuff like that. I think trying to take a holistic approach, I think all of us um, are, are sort of doing different things and, and we need to have probably better conversations around like how do we learn from each other. I think that's such an important piece, right? We think oftentimes um, when we're engaged in equity work about bringing all of the stakeholders together. And oftentimes I think that that comes across as like, oh, so I'm bringing, I'm communicating with like folks who, who don't necessarily have the same perspectives as me. And, you know, like Derek Bell's, you know, interest convergence, like is my goal. But sometimes it means like I need to reach out to other folks who are engaging in this work, whether within my institution, but a different department or, you know, at, at a sibling college to be like, what are you doing? How are you doing? Right. And I also think that this requires like at least, you know, Aaron, for you and I and folks who are um, in kind of um, a role of privilege as researchers, it, it takes us stepping in or stepping back as well and saying like, how do we decide, you know, kind of epistemologically, what is data? What is valid, right? Um, whether it's, you know, student experience through case study, right? Or whether it's it's something quantitative or mixed, or maybe it's the conversations that, you know, our educators have with students on the daily basis, right? Um, and how are those things privileged and seen as rigorous enough or trustworthy research? Um, because I, I know that in my experience, you know, um, like guest editing journals or serving as a reviewer, you know, oftentimes the most rich data is also the data that that gets turned away as as not being methodologically sound or like there's not there there's kind of um this assumption that practitioners will have the same level of access to resources like time and training um, in terms of methodology to produce 
data that we consider to be data. Um, when in fact, if we can expand the way that we think about what data is or how we're collecting this information from students, we can learn a lot from each other, I think. Um, I, think I think one example with that that I would drive home for, for folks who are here is, you know, I, I think of um, the advisors and the people that we have in, in our network who have these strong backgrounds in counseling and in social work and things like that who I think are, are really attuned to student experiences, their perceptions, their feelings, like how they're going through and how, um, how they're experiencing, like if they're struggling in developmental math or if they're doing something. And it, and it ends up being a much more holistic approach rather than just looking at outcomes data or um, these really dry survey results. Like I think that they have a perspective to share that is incredibly important. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, it's been now, I've been out of the community college almost as long as I've been in, right, to date myself a little bit. Um, and I think about that constantly. I still teach in an IRW program, um, and I coordinate it, but I'm not in that lived reality day in, day out, you know, five classes a term or something anymore. And I think that, that um, that's humbling to remember that when we get to be in other spaces with folks who do have that experiential knowledge. So um, I was involved in, in uh, a series of interviews with folks we referred to as activist administrators. And this began um, as work out of the Equity Access and Inclusion Network for the National Organization for Student Success. Um, and we gathered a panel of college presidents and pretty high level administrators about four years ago um, at a NOS conference um, and asked them what they did to sustain themselves in equity oriented work. These were folks who had been recognized either nationally or regionally for having a strong reputation as administrators who are committed to equity work. Um, and so from that original um, panel for the NOS conference, we used kind of a snowball sampling method and we interviewed about 17 folks um, to ask them about their experiences as administrators. We were very intentional to try and get diversity in our sample based on gender identity, sexual orientation, um, regional, um, two-year, four-year context, um, as well as race. Um, and so these are the, the findings that I'm presenting to you today from, from their words of wisdom. They're not because I think I have all of the answers here. Um, but I, I wanted to share some of the specific practices or kind of practical next steps um, that that group shared with us. The first thing that they talked about overall was this notion of staying true to your mission. And we saw that in Brown McNair um, et al's volume about kind of identifying or articulating the mission and then connecting data collection to the mission, right? But now, especially when we are being told that we can't talk about equity explicitly, right, um, or inclusion, now is a key time to evaluate or reevaluate our mission statements and our strategic planning in order to emphasize student success. And again, I want to reiterate here, student defined success is really what we're, we're moving towards, right? So it's a great time for us to make sure that our mission statements, our value statements, our strategic plans are specifically stating our commitment to equitable success and that that's grounded around the values that our students are articulating, whether that's from focus groups that we're holding formally, right? Or whether that's from the language and the experiences that we're having with our students um, in those one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's always so really important that we understand the opposition, right? The folks who are saying that we can't talk about equity, access, and inclusion, right? In order for us to prepare, prepare for our own subversive success, right? So understand the specifics of what is being banned or what your institution perceives as being banned and what specifically is allowed. Right? creatively funneling our resources for projects or initiatives. Oftentimes offices are being banned, right? Particularly in Texas, we can't have DEI offices anymore, but that doesn't mean that we can't have the specific programming that fell under those offices, right? Um, I think a great example at Texas State is we had a couple of scholarship funds. One was earmarked for Black students in particular, one was um, earmarked for Latine students. These became general scholarship funds, but the framing of the mission of those scholarship funds, right, remains the same. The commitment to ensuring that racially minoritized students, first generation students, right, um, 
students who are Pell Grant recipients is still um, listed in kind of the language of those scholarship funds, despite the fact that there isn't a DEI office overseeing them directly. Another thing that we can be doing is making sure that we're working to promote an environment of academic freedom, particularly those of us in four-year contexts, I think, um, can lean on this a little bit more than some of the folks in our, our two-year um, siblings institutions. Um, but Iowa, for example, um, limits the official position that institutions can take right, in terms of what can be said about equity, um, access and inclusion, but that does not have any bearing on restricting faculty's academic freedom or their disciplinary expertise, for example. And I bring up Iowa because it was a really recent change. Um, and then, of course, Aaron's own move from there. Um, but that, I think, was a bill that passed in April into law. Um, and so some of the universities and the community colleges there are already working um, through what this means on kind of a ground level perspective. How will they make sure through their faculty senates um, or their faculty led groups so that their faculty's academic freedom is and disciplinary expertise is protected so that they can continue to engage in these conversations despite the fact that like universities or colleges for example can no longer post um, you know statements that they view to be uh, divisive they're only divisive when they don't agree with them right the next um, piece of advice that we got in these interviews was finding ways to support your team, right? And this means really committing to developing, maintaining, and retaining individuals, right? So one of the things that we've seen across the country, but particularly in Texas, with the elimination of DEI offices, is a lot of reorganization of staff. Right. Um, and so as DEI offices go away, their director is suddenly like the special assistant to the president. Well, special assistant sounds like one step away from like 1970 secretary. Right. Um, and so there are some challenges that we need to work through with languaging and the way that titles are perceived. But in this reorganization of staff, what are we doing to make sure that the role that was created and preserved under the original office is still maintained despite the reorganization of the org chart, right? And what are we doing to make sure that we're not policing ourselves? For example, that we're not going further than what the actual um, statutes are saying can or cannot be done. Another important piece of this is making sure that we're supporting our faculty and staff unions and organizations. Um, in the state of Texas, we don't have um, a very strong history of labor, but that's not necessarily the case throughout the country, right? Um, and I'm seeing, as I talk to folks across Texas, um, more of a commitment to informal and kind of de facto support for faculty who are engaging in this work. That might be at like the chair or the associate chair level um, saying, yeah, I have your back. I'm gonna allow you or encourage you to continue talking about you know, systemic injustice in an intro to criminology class, something like that. Um, or in education, we're gonna intro to education, we're gonna continue to talk about CRT as it relates um, as a theory of education, right? Creating an environment that models the pursuit of knowledge through conversation and collaboration and is another important piece of this. We've seen a lot of um, pushback, um, especially at the, the level of, of presidents um, on the national level, um, when conservative um, political actors don't appreciate the statements that presidents have been making um, in favor of academic freedom or freedom of speech, for example. Um, but making sure that in our classrooms, in our learning centers, um, and in the spaces that we do have spheres of control, that we're articulating and shining the values that we're modeling productive conversations and respect for each other in, in order to collaborate, right? Whether this is also including it in institutional or department level mission statements or making sure that we're modeling like the Socratic seminar or um, you know, having challenging conversations in our class. And then of course, distinguishing between individual and institutional actions, right? So um, when I first moved to Texas, I was told by another faculty member at a different Texas institution, well, I can't write a letter um, to 
to the Texas legislature, um, were not allowed to as educators. Um, and what that individual conflated was their institution's rule that they can't use their institutional email address in order to address a political issue and their right as a private citizen to speak up as an educated member of society who's directly impacted by some of the legislation that was being put forward at the time, right? So another thing that we can do, particularly again, if we're in these places where we're maybe overseeing a small group or even a large group of faculty and staff is to make sure that even if our folks are hearing the messaging that they can't be involved, that they can't speak out officially or that the institution is no longer allowed to make these kinds of stances, that as private citizens, they still have rights um, and they are really expected to be informed um, and educated democratic citizens. The next piece of this is about drawing from the expertise of our institutional allies. Remember that no one administrator is an island. Um, I serve as a program coordinator. I oversee about 15 faculty members and we serve anywhere from about 14 to 1500 students in our INRW um, program annually. By myself, I'm like, oh yeah, I got this. Like we're doing great, but I have no budget. I have no co-coordinator or any real support on my own. I have to be able to connect with other administrators, with our faculty and our staff as well, when I wanna move and get support in order to get things done. So I've been spending a lot of time connecting to folks in learning assistance, connecting to our other developmental programming in mathematics to try and build more interest in creating a community of practice for developmental education. Um, and those of you that have been, um, participating in like the co-board webinars or some of the like CRCM, CRSM grants. Um, these are great ways, but it's kind of, it feels small money when you divide it up um, among all of the hands that are outstretched. But, you know, $100,000 grants spread across a two year period of time to create things like a community of practice, right? To invest in your faculty so that they can work together to learn more about what it means to work together as developmental educators. Um, another important thing that I've learned at my time just in Texas State is to keep connecting with legal. Um, we have a team of lawyers, apparently. I don't know where they exist, right? They they respond to my emails. Um, but anytime I want to do something, um, I, I have to get it cleared by legal. And I've started taking what I'm referring to as the John Oliver approach. I think that this is because John Oliver did a thing, I want to say, on Twitter and X. Um, and legal was like, no, 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 you can't do that. Our job is to make sure you don't get sued. And John Oliver's response was, no, your job is to keep me out of jail when I do get sued, right? Um, and so it's the kind of like beg forgiveness rather than permission, right? Be in touch with legal to say like, this is the work that we're doing. Help me understand the letter of the law. What exactly is allowed here at the institution? And when they come back with their legalese and they say, no, no, you can't do that, then the response is, oh, thank you. Help me understand where exactly in these statutes or where exactly in our SOP does it say that I can't do this thing that I'm doing, right? Um, and have a dialogue with legal. And then, of course, creating partnerships across our faculty, staff, and administrator lines. Um, our faculty um, and our staff need to be supported, especially in the work that we do to do things like club-sponsored events and promoting equitable decision-making, right? Diversifying the table. And this means oftentimes thinking about the way that we, for example, expand the faculty union so that it's faculty and staff. So I don't have too much time left today, um, but I wanted to share with you um, a sample of the, the articles that I sent out to Dr. Doran, and you can get them from her, or you can get them from me, or if you just kind of want to hear, like, we talked earlier about, or I threw out this idea of beloved community, um, and so we're not going to get to this how-to list, right, um, and I think that maybe one of the closest things I've ever seen to that is the Equity to Equity Walk book that Dr. Doran was talking about, but I think it's really important that in these times when we're being told no, 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 or it's anti-equity, anti- DEI, we can't do these things, that we need an equally strong theory to guide the work that we are doing. That's fine to like understand where the boundaries are of the no, but then where are the boundaries of the yes and what it is that we're committing to doing? Um, and for me, that work comes out of um, Martin Luther King's work on beloved community. Um, and I actually, I published a chapter um, in, in a, a handbook um, on beloved community 
specific to trans inclusion, but the, the kind of central tenets of beloved community are not specific to like LB, LGBTQIA plus issues um, by any means. Um, the first one is radical love. And it's this notion that we're positioning all stakeholders as valued members of our community. Um, and again, I'm not gonna like read through all of this here. You can get the chapter, or you can get other pieces of this later on. And many people I think are probably already familiar with Dr. King's work. But I do wanna think about what this means for us, particularly as educators, right? This notion of radical love needs to be actualized um, as something that's critical in nature, right? We need to be able to name and talk about power and challenge injustice. And we can't do that by beginning with the other and the institution. We have to begin with ourselves. And that Equity Walk to Equity Talk book, or sorry, Equity Talk to Equity Walk book does a great job of kind of laying out a framework and a series of steps for beginning that self-work. Okay, um, Kendi and D'Angelo's books also are great places to begin. I think it's also really important that we spend some time clarifying our terms to make sure that we have some shared goals, right? And this creates a space for deep listening when we're talking to those other stakeholders, right? So when we're talking to folks who maybe don't understand, for example, what developmental education is, and so they really want to fight to eliminate it because they think that that's the barrier to success for our students, right? Um, I think the other piece of this that's really important for our conversation today is also the way that we need to work on rejecting frames of competition. It's really easy, especially in these polarizing political times, for us to think in terms of us versus them um, frames, right? But rather than villainizing narratives that talk about, you know, who is the bad guy and therefore who is the victim, I think it's important for us to think about this in terms of Bell's work on interest convergence and also to recognize the innate humanity of the stakeholders who come to the table. Because whether we come as an educator, a student, an administrator, or as a, you know, a reformer, we're all engaged in this work because we do believe in in equity and in educational justice. We might need to work to define and make sure we have a shared understanding of those concepts, but we're here with kind of a, a similar goal of, of change and betterment of the system. The second piece that King talks about in Beloved Community is the notion of radical inclusion. And this is kind of focusing on the way that we include all members of the community. The piece of this that I think is most important to us is thinking about radical inclusion, not as equal inclusion, but rather as equitable inclusion. So for me, um, as a program administrator, this means that I'm not coming to a meeting and I'm saying everyone has a seat at the table. And so my adjunct who gets paid $3,500 to teach this course gets the same amount of work and responsibility as my tenured faculty member who gets 84,000, right? Or my associate dean who gets 100 and whatever thousand, right? It's thinking about how everybody contributes, but in a manner that is equitable, reaching towards a parity of outcomes. Um, and Herstein talks about this in terms of, first of all, beginning with this, again, shared understanding that we're all human, that we're all engaging in this work, not from a perspective of division, but from the desire to commit to work together to create a better space for us all. And that of course requires dialogue, requires deep listening and making sure that all voices are heard. In practice, again, I think this means that we have to work really hard on rejecting those competition frames. I think it can become very easy for us to say, well, administrators don't understand this work or our legislators don't understand our work or our students saying about us, my professor doesn't understand my work, right? Um, but at the end of the day, committing to, to working together, committing towards radical inclusion means that we're focusing on those things that we have in common. I found in my own work at Texas State um, that it's really helpful to come back to our mission or our vision statement, as well as our articulated goals. So we have an articulated, agreed upon goal of student success. And so the work that I want us to do as a group, whether or not we all come in understanding that, is to work towards those goals that we as an institution have said we're agreeing upon, that we're all committing to student success. And now let's have a conversation about what student success means. And maybe that's going to require that somebody says to me, Emily, let's 
go and talk to our students before you define success, right? Yeah. Maybe that's somebody is going to need to say to me, like, you know, I think that that's a really great understanding of student success that privileges our students who come in and are already poised for success. What are we doing to make sure that we're creating this space where all students can be successful? Um, and the last piece of this, and I think that this is particularly important um, for educators who are doing this work, committing to equity on top of all of the work that you're doing, is um, balance. And King talks about balance um, in his writing related to beloved community really in two different ways. The first way I think is the most obvious, and so I actually put it second on our slide. That's this idea that we've been talking about with radical inclusion. We need balance with our, in our community, right? Engaging with others, working through our difference, et cetera. But the piece that I know that I struggle with, that I see my faculty struggling with, and my students as well, is that balance within ourselves. Right, especially in this time when everyone is so busy and stressed out, what are we doing to demonstrate for ourselves and engage in practices of radical self-love? What are we doing to make sure that we're being self-compassionate? And some of that can come with role clarity, right? If my job is to be a, a program coordinator, for example, then that might mean that I need to oversee different classes, but I'm not responsible for creating all of the curriculum or for showing up um, for an instructor who I don't think is doing the work in the way that I want them to be doing, right? That might not be, that might be something that I want to do, but that not, might not be my place and in my space. Similarly, right, if um, an individual is coming into this work as an adjunct and has a real heart for equity um, and inclusion work, but isn't being paid to sit on 17 different committees at their various institutions in order to, to serve um, as a representative, then that shouldn't be part of the work that they're expecting of themselves. And that can't be something that we, whether it's as full-time faculty, um, as allies in administration or any other role, can ask of them either. In my, in my work with my instructors, um, I've tried to practice balancing leading and following. Um, and for me lately, this has meant really making sure that I'm supporting future leaders. I work in a doctoral program. And so I spend a lot of my time not only mentoring my students in their dissertation writing and their researching, but also thinking about what it means for them to be in Pat Sullivan's framing, teacher, scholar, activist. Right? Um, and I think that that also means that we have to make sure that we're making appropriate space for both practice and scholarship, as well as our activism work. That requires that we're articulating and working towards those goals that we talked about earlier. That also requires, again, that kind of sense of, of self to say that this is not what I can achieve today, the impossible. Working towards equity is a longer term journey. So I wanna end here. I think we have about five minutes left for us to think and chat or just to be, um, but to, to ask you to commit to thinking about these questions in the coming days. First, where will you go from here? What's the next step in your institution's journey towards becoming student ready? And how will you engage in this work through the principles of beloved community? Emily, you said something at the top that really struck with me and I think is still really relevant here of um, we don't often ask students what success means to them and, and we don't um, often include students in these notions around like what we think they need versus like what they might actually need. And so I just wanted to reiterate that point because I think that that is just something that is incredibly important. We spent like a minimal amount to buy pizza for I think like three or five different events. Um, and we we bought enough pizza to feed an army, but in the hopes that our students would come and talk to us about their experiences and what they thought success meant, um, particularly in the developmental literacy um, classes at Texas State. And we were 
Um, we were really honored at some of the insights that students shared with us, um, but I don't think it has to be even something as as formal or like, you know, if you're not being supported by a semi-gracious dean who's willing to, you know, buy 70 pizzas, like it doesn't even have to be that expensive, right? Um, my instructors spend a lot of time asking students to do free writing about their goals, um, asking them to think about how the assignments that they're doing in their literacy classes or their math classes connect to their purposes for being in the college. And I think that's also a really like fruitful way to begin conversations. Um, and some of the best conversations that I think they have then come from like a follow-up email where it's like, oh, I didn't realize that you wanted to do something or that you were going through this thing. Like, tell me more about that. Like, um, like tell me what brought you here and tell me what's keeping you here. I think that those are really powerful questions um, and they're so simple. And how validating that is. I think, you know, for, for a student who can just feel seen at that point and, and can feel like, their instructor is just really um, validating and saying like, how do I support this? How do I act in a way that will get you where you want to be? Which I think is very much at the heart of not just the work that Catch the Next does, but the work that most community college instructors, if not all of community college instructors, like the, of, of, that's at the heart of education, right? That we're there at the service of our students and their goals, their dreams. Did anybody have any questions or any comments that they wanted to make? You're, you're absolutely um, welcome to make use of the chat uh, if you're feeling shy. Um, I have shared, Ricardo, I just saw that you unmuted. I was gonna say thank you. Nope, I've got no, a lot of uh, ideas here now, so I'll see what I can do and I'll go look for legal and set up a contact with them and see how anything I do or potentially want to do, how it's gonna be affected legally. I think that the best lesson I got from that personally was like not taking their response as a no, right? Like they're lawyers, they were born to argue and they don't seem to find it confrontational um, for me to come back and be like, but what about, or help me understand why, right? Um, and so I found that I um, am blessed to get support from kind of these like um, unexpected institutional allies. Um, nobody, I don't think goes into post-secondary education because they wanna be the no man. Um, and even if our job ends up like making us feel like kind of the no, sometimes um, I, I found that folks are still really invested in kind of talking through how do we continue to do this work? Um, so I guess, Ricardo, one of the things that that I did was um, I wanted to hire faculty, right? And so we can't have a diversity statement. So I was like, so how do I make sure I get the type of faculty who would be qualified to work at an HSI and in a space like Texas State, right? Um, a lot of times, um, you know, we, we get tons of applicants, but how do I make sure that these are applicants who actually understand my student population? And so the response that I got was, you can't have a diversity statement anymore, but you can still say in your required qualifications that they have experienced teaching in context similar to your own, right? And you can list out the demographics of your, you know, your institution. Um, I was encouraged to, to um, include questions in because you have to have like the same interview questions for everyone now, right? But like, give me a specific example of how you work with students from this particular demographic or talk me through how you would work through this challenging instance related to, you know, maybe something like conflict in the classroom or, you know, fill in the blank. We have so many kind of hot potato political issues right now. Um, but I was, I was encouraged to get those kinds of responses because while they might have felt like a no um, to me before I, I guess I kind of got a little more aggressive. Um, nowadays, those kinds of like, not this way feel more like a, so you didn't say no about this other thing. I think that's, that's probably a, 
Yeah. I feel like, I feel like those are, those are great things to remember that like, you're, you're not being combative. You're not being aggressive or whatever. You're, you're, you're still doing what you can to remain in compliance and in everything like that. And to still find, um, ways, um, with the changing context that we're in to, to serve students. So, and our, our deans, our administrators understand this, right? Like they, they weren't out there leading the charges to get rid of our DEI offices. They understand what this means potentially for our students, if nothing else, like in terms of climate, right? And students' sense of belonging on campus. And so I found that they've been really receptive to thinking kind of creatively about how we can, again, like continue to meet the same goals um, with slightly different languaging. We, we, for example, shifted away from DEI to talking about student belonging, um, right? Like anybody who actually reads that understands that Strayhorn developed that theory by working first with Black men and then Latinos, right? Like, okay, we're not talking about race, we're talking about belonging. And that seems to make everybody feel good. But also it's a theoretical framework that was developed by working from the exact student populations that we're trying to serve. Um, so I found that like having these kind of um, talking points, having like scholarship that I can cite or theoretical frameworks, um, and then kind of that like willingness to engage, but like um, also the like, I don't know, I want to say like standardized white means of communicating and I think some like this zoom meeting is now being recorded that'll be the only thing anybody hears is like Emily so says you have to be a standard white speaker in order to get legal done that is not at all what I mean but right like we have to be able to communicate in kind of these um, expected discourses um, and so I think coming into those spaces recognizing that I don't maybe know all of the language but that I'm here to learn it and that my communication partners are not out there to like dang me for not knowing it, but are willing to help teach it to me has also, I think, been, been valuable. All right, since I know we're a couple of minutes after the hour, um, I want to just extend my thanks to you, Dr. Seth, that was incredible. And um, thank you for sharing the readings as well. Um, we will make sure that those get sent out to our partners and everything like that. And um, just really, really appreciate the content of this presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you.